He had a press conference and he got upset about somebody asking him about his dead son. He pulls out a rosary and says, I wear this every day and I pray every day about my, for my dead son. Prayer is an interesting thing. Religion is always about prayer, about talking to God about things. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Uh, verse 16, rejoice evermore is the short, is the, if, if John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept is the shortest verse in an English Bible. Verse 16 is the shortest verse in a Greek Bible. Rejoice evermore. And then he says, pray without ceasing. Rejoicing leads into being willing to talk to God and talk to God without ceasing. And that, that issue of praying without ceasing, that tells you something about prayer. Prayer is not the ritual of praying, uh, you know, a, a rosary or a bunch of beads and, and things. Prayer is not an, an issue of, of, of repeating uh, things that, that you've said over and over and over again. Years ago, my wife and I were at a PTA meeting when we lived in Elmwood Park and uh, for the school where my children were going. And down the street, a fire truck went. And right in the middle of the PTA meeting, the, the, the fire truck goes by and then it stops about a block down the street from where we were. And, of course, everybody that's there, you know, somebody's house is on fire. And so the lady that was running the meeting, she said, Mr. So-and-so, would you go see whose house that is? And while he's doing that, let's pray. And they all bowed their head and started praying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so on, the, the Our Father prayer. Now, this is a Roman Catholic neighborhood. That's, that's the Roman Catholic prayer. And I'm, and I'm sitting there thinking, what in the world would our Father chart there in heaven, hallowed be that? What would that have to do with somebody's house on fire? If you don't talk to God, talk, you know, it's not just a matter of repeating. In fact, Jesus told the disciples when he, gave, when he talked about that, uh, it's really the disciples' prayer. When he talked about that, he gave them that our Father prayer. Before he did, he said, don't pray like the heathen because they think they're going to be heard for much, they're much speaking. Don't do what everybody does with it. Don't just go with a vain repetition. So prayer is not just that. It's not what everybody thinks about. It's not when you bow your head, close your eyes, and say, oh, God, our Father. When it says pray without ceasing, you can't do that. You leave here, and you get up on that freeway out there, you better pray, <laughs> but you better do it with your eyes open. I mean, the idea of, my point is the idea of what we generally think about prayer is, is not what fits in these verses. So praying isn't... It, to pray is to talk to God. When it says pray without ceasing, every conscious thought you have, listen, if you're a believer, you are in Christ and Christ is in you. You have an intimate, constant communion with him, unbroken because of who he is. And the idea is you're to live in that consciousness of, of his presence in your life all the time. And the conversation, you, you know, do you talk to yourself? I know you do. You think about, you know, my dad used to say, you know, it's okay to talk to yourself. It's good to have an intelligent conversation every now and then. And that's a good thing. You don't have to worry about it until you start answering yourself. Well, when you think in your mind, if you, if you, if you get into the mindset that, listen, I'm not just talking to myself. There's the Lord. Have you been, you know, my wife and I, if, if, if she just talks to herself all day long and I'm standing there, you know what I feel? A little left out. If you just talk to yourself all day long and don't talk, the Lord's right there with you and you don't talk to him, you're missing out on something. And the idea of praying without ceasing is bring all of your thinking about life, all of the things that you deal with in life, bring that before the Lord and talk to the Lord about what's going on. Instead of talking to yourself, talk to him. Now, when you want him to answer you, how's he going to do it? Don't listen for that little small voice in the back of your head, back kind of stuff, you know. That's not how God talks. How does God talk to you? you got a book. And what the, what talking to the Lord, and when you talk to him, you talk and he talks back. That's the renewing of your mind with God's word. And so you get this back and forth. Now you're able, now, now you're bringing the things that God's word tells you into, into the context of what you're doing in life. And how can, what your word say, what does your word say about this? Well, maybe I have to go look. That's why we study. That's why we, that's why the purpose of our meetings here is to teach you how to get into God's word and get out of it what God's doing. And then take that and how do I apply that? How to bring it into life? You never do that without prayer. The word and prayer, they work hand in hand together. Look over at Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2. The instruction Paul gives you about prayer is that it's to be part of an intimate relationship that you have with God where you're discussing, you're, you're bringing into your mind, into your thinking process, renewing your mind in that constant thinking process about what's going on in life before the Lord. 
Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, continue in prayer, watching the same with thanksgiving. Don't quit praying without ceasing. Don't give up on it. Don't stop. If you look down at verse number 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He didn't quit. He just kept on with it. And it, it was a constant thinking before the Lord about what could be done in order to edify the saints. Chapter 1, verse 3 in Colossians, he says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Every time he thought about them, he talked to God about them, he's always, he continues in that. In other words, it isn't just thinking about something, it's thinking before the Lord about it, talking to God about what's going on. That's to be the normal way that you pray is to be constantly communicating and constantly communing with, 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 with God about in your, in your spirit about what's going on in life and talking to him about what's happening. You don't have a part of your life where you have him in it and a part of your life where you don't have him in it. He, he, contain, he, he fills up all of your thinking process. So prayer for, and the dispensation of grace, prayer is, is that ability that you have to have intimate communication and communion with your heavenly father over all of your life and you do it in your mind and in your spirit. Now, when you talk about prayer, the basic fallacy in prayer preaching and prayer practice is a failure to rightly divide God's word. You got to understand your relationship with him is based upon who, who he says you are. The message that most people hear the things that most people practice in regard to prayer really has nothing to do with what God's doing today. Most Come with me to Romans chapter 15. Most, most prayer practice, most prayer preaching that you hear really has, has very little, if anything, to do with what God's doing today. Most of it has to do with what he did in time past with the nation Israel, the kingdom program. And that's not where we are today. If you don't understand that, understand who you are and able to communicate with God in relationship to who you... He knows who you are in His Son. He knows you're a member of the body of Christ. He knows you're not Israel. He knows you're not the king. He knows what He's doing. If you don't, it doesn't change His mind. He's not going to do what you tell Him to do. He tells you what He's doing. And it's our privilege to be a part of what He's doing. Romans 15, verse 8. The book of Romans. We're, we're going to start studying Romans, I promise, in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be in California next weekend and, and be back after that. And, and my intention is to start teaching Romans when I get back. But the book of Romans is a fascinating thing. Everything that, that you, about this and such stuff, Romans lays it out for you. Romans 15, verse 8. Now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister. Now, listen, Jesus Christ is God. He's our Savior. He's all kind of different things, but as a minister, Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. In his earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. That's the nation Israel. He was there fulfilling the promises made unto the fathers. He's there accomplishing all the things that the prophets, the, 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 the uh, covenants and promises God had made with Abraham, with David, all the prophecies about the kingdom program. He's fulfilling the promises that God had made to Abraham, to David, and to the nation Israel. And that's what's there. So when you're studying and you're reading the earthly ministry of Christ, you're in time past, Christ ministering to the nation Israel. Now, if you look down at verse number 16, start in verse 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in, in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. Now, when it talks about the grace that's given to me of God, if you want to, you want to write down a reference, cross-reference to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 to 9. Talks about the grace is given to him, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery which was kept secret in, in, in time past, but now is made manifest. Why did he give him that position, that grace, that I should preach, that that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, 
that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was the ministry of the nation Israel, the circumcision. He goes to heaven, sends, sends back, uh, saves the apostle Paul, and sends him out as the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That's why in chapter 11, verse number 13, Paul said, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. It's not, it's not, the issue is not Paul. This is the position Christ gave him as the, his minister to the Gentiles. So when, you, when you're looking for information for us, you're not going to go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get your information about how prayer works. You're going to go to the Apostle Paul because he's the one that God gave us today. Understanding that distinction between prophecy and the mystery, that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, and that which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. Understanding that division, that distinction, so that you know who you are and where you are in the Bible. That's the key. And the fallacy in, in, in prayer practice and prayer preaching is that people don't recognize this is who we are. They go back over here into the, in, in the time past and try to get those prayer promises. Go with me to Matthew 21. The problem with, with doing that is that these things cause confusion in your life. Matthew chapter 21. You've all, all heard these verses. Matthew 21, verse number 22. And all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Now, that's a wonderful promise. But the difficulty you're going to have is if you start thinking that's about you, what's going to happen? It ain't going to work. And when it doesn't work, then what do you do? You have to divide. Well, why didn't it work? Well, when it says all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. So if I didn't receive it, it must be I didn't believe it. Listen, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you had enough faith to move God himself out of heaven into your heart. Well, you know how to believe. People say, well, the reason you didn't get it is there's sin in your life. Listen, if you had to not have sin in your life, for God to answer a prayer, you'd never even smell a prayer answer coming, let's just get one. You? Come on. Beside, what did Jesus Christ do when he, what did God do when he forgave you all of your trespasses? How many is all of them? All of them. Romans 4 says he will not impute sin unto you. If you understand what happened to you when you got saved and how God took away all of your sin and took them, put them under the blood of Christ and took them out of the way and refuses to impute them to you because he sent them to his son, he's not going to have, double, he's not going to have a double payment for them. You are completely and totally forgiven. There's no barrier between you and God. Then it isn't because you got sin in your life. So, so, well, Satan hindered them. Are you nuts? <laughs> Satan hindered them? The God of heaven is being hindered by Satan? You say, well, he just said wait. I love that one. I'll answer them when you get to heaven. But you know, when I read that verse, I, that's not what that verse says. And you know that. Ask. What, what is it? Prayers ask, A-S-K, Matthew 5, Matthew 7, verse 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Ask. And you say, well, look at Matthew 7. You guys are looking at me like you don't know what the verses are. Well, that'd be good. It means you forgot some of your religious past. Matthew 7, 7, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, I'm sorry, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Ask, seek, and you shall find, knock, and it shall be given. When I was a kid, they said, that's prayer. Ask, A, ask, S, seek, knock, and what happens? You ask, you seek, you knock, you get it. And that's the Sermon on the Mount. That's the Beatitudes. Everybody knows that's what God... And you say, well, you see, when people, when you go by those things, you're putting yourself up for failure because God knows what he's doing and you've never been big enough a day in your life to make God do something he isn't doing. 
And I don't care who you are, me, you, or anybody else. So you need to understand, well, then why don't these things work? Because they're not about what God's doing today in the dispensation of grace. This is the ministry of Jesus Christ of the circumcision confirming the promises made to the fathers. This is part of prophecy. This is that part of that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. And you're over here in a program that he didn't tell anybody about until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul and said, your information comes to you through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, the reason I say all that is come with me to Matthew chapter 4. Because when you start back here in the Gospels for your prayer promises, that has something to do with how to pray for the sick. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. I'll start in verse 12, Matthew 4, 12. And when Jesus had heard that John, that's John the Baptist, was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. <clears throat> verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what's called the gospel of the kingdom, verse 23. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and watch, healing See that next word? All manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And the fame of and, and, and his fame went throughout the Syria. And they brought unto him all the all sick people that were taken with divers uh, diseases and torments, and those that were possessed with devils, and those that, which were lunatic, and those we got John in there. That's good. And th those that had palsy, and he healed them. There's something like 41 different times in, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the earth of ministry of Christ that he, has, he heals people. And over and over and over, the healing program is there. Come over with me to chapter 11. He would go out and people would come and they'd bring the sick. And listen, when you have sick folks, we have Sick folks, Alex mentioned a moment ago, here in our assembly, some quite serious at the moment. And when you have those kind of things, you want to, you want to see people get well. And you're looking for the healing, the physical relief. And so they would bring them. Matthew chapter 11, we talk about John the Baptist, verse number 2. And when Jesus, I'm sorry, when John, that's John the Baptist, had heard in prison the works of Christ. John's been put into prison. He's been put in jail. Herod took him. He hears the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? In other words, if you're the Messiah, what am I doing in jail? Jesus answered and said unto him, Here's how Jesus is going to tell John, You figure out who I am. He's going to quote Isaiah chapter 33. Jesus said, uh, answered verse 4 and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Quote, Isaiah 33, The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he that whosoever shall not be offended. In order to demonstrate to John who he was, that he was the Messiah, he says, go and tell John, remember what you saw. You saw exactly what Isaiah 33 said. Now come back with me to Isaiah 33. Why he quoted that passage. I'm sorry, it's Isaiah 35, not 33. Close. That's close. Closer than you would have gotten. But. Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah 35. Verse number three, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. That's what Christ is doing for John. Say to them that are of faint heart, and that's what John, he's questioning. Be strong, fear not. Behold, and watch, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. How do you know when your God has showed up, John? Verse 5, then when God has come, the eyes of the blind shall be open, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then, then when God comes, shall the lame man leap as a heart and the, the tongue of, of the deaf sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break, break out and streams in the desert. 
and so forth. In other words, he says to John, what did you see me do? You saw me do all these healing things. Why? Because that was a testimony. That was a sign. That was a, 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 a proof that I'm God. I'm the Messiah. Because when, when the Messiah comes, you're going to see those things happen. So when he's telling John, look at what you saw, because that's going to prove to you who I am. Now, that's why in Mark chapter 16, when Christ sends his apostles out and their commission, he says to them, Mark 16, verse number 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. These things were signs, identifying markers. First Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that the Jew requires a sign. From the time of Moses in Exodus chapter 4, when God sends Moses to deliver Israel, he gave Moses two signs. Moses said, how are they going to, I'm going to go down there. How are they going to know that, that you sent me? He said, there's two things you're going to do. One, put your hand in your bosom, pull it out as leprous. Put it in again and it comes out, it's healed. The other is you take a rod, throw it down, becomes a serpent, pick it up. The sign of physical healing and casting out devils, demons. Those two signs, the prominent signs. Jesus Christ goes around and preaches the, the gospel of the kingdom. Healing and casting out devils, Luke, Luke chapter 8. That, those are the two signs, the two pointers that prove, demonstrate that Jesus Christ is the Messiah to Israel. And the Jews require that. So in Mark 16, he says, when you go out and you're preaching, these signs you follow them to believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, they shall t if, and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Not they might, not they ought to, not if it's my will for them at the moment. They will. Why? Because that's part of the restoration program God has for the nation Israel. All that healing program has something to do with what God's doing with the nation Israel. Now, if you come over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. When you come over, by the way, into the book of Acts, the healing, the healing programs, Christ does something like 40, 41 uh, different healings in Matthew. And Luke. In the book of Acts, they're, 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 they're not as many. They kind of, kind of slows down a little bit. And the healing, the miracles in the book of Acts are all dispensational in nature. And I don't have time to go through all of that, but uh, we, when you see the, the different healings, the, the, the the miracles were designed to communicate doctrine. They're not just designed to do something. It's not just, well, what can I get up and go do today? They and in the book of Acts, they're communicating the doctrine. Peter's going into the temple in Acts chapter 3, and there's a lame man asking for alms. And he says, silver, gold, have enough. What I have, I'll give unto you. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And he jumps up and he goes praising God in the temple. That's what the little flock's going to do. For, picture what God's going to do for the nation Israel through the little flock. Bring them in, in, in rejoicing in, into the kingdom. Paul's first miracle, Acts chapter 13, he goes into to a town there, and there's a, there's a Gentile, ruler of the city, Sergius Paulus, and he wants to hear the word of God. And then there's a Jew, Elimaeus, that withstands him, doesn't want him to hear God's word. What's happening? That's exactly what's going on dispensationally with Paul's ministry. Israel rejects, doesn't want Paul's ministry to go to the Gentiles. Paul goes to him, and at the end of the thing, he, he says he blinds the Jew so the Gentile can see and, and receive the word. And when the Gentile saw that, he saw the doctrine of the Lord. So God's communicating some truth in those things. When you come to 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. God gave gifts, some spiritual gifts. Verse number 9, one of those gifts and another faith by the same word and another the gifts of healing by the same spirit. So the, these spiritual gifts are communicated so that there's a picture, there, there's, there's a, an authenticity of God's word working through uh, the ministry that Paul has. Now those spiritual gifts were there, but they're not going to be permanent. If you look at chapter 13, verse number 8, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be Knowledge, it shall vanish away. Then when he says prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, he's not talking about prophecy that God gives not coming to pass or there being a time when people can't talk. That's the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of knowledge that he's talked about earlier in the chapter. There's a time when the gift of prophecy is going to no longer operate. There's a time when the gift of tongues are going to 
going to cease. There's a time when the gift of knowledge is going to vanish away. Why? For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part should be done away. Now look at the verse carefully. If you know in part, you prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, what is, it that, what is the perfect? People say, well, that's heaven. You, do you have to wait to heaven to get? No, look at, there's no heaven in the context here. What's in part? Verse 9, knowledge. We know in part. So we exercise the gifts in part. But when that which is perfect, complete, what is it that completes partial knowledge? Full knowledge, right. So when full knowledge comes, that which is in part shall be done away with. So he says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish thinking, childish thoughts, because what? I've, I've, got, I've, got, the, I've got mature. I'm, I'm an adult. When the completion of the revelation of God's word comes, there won't be a need for the supernatural giving of gifts in order for you to do the things that you need to do. When you didn't have a Bible, you didn't have the complete revelation, God gave some supernatural empowerments to accomplish these things. But once the Word of God is completed, then you don't need the supernatural empowerment given to certain people. Now, everybody has all the equipping that you need in God's Word. Amen. So when you come over to 1 Timothy, now this is why when you get to 1 Timothy chapter 5, Now think about the, the things that you read about back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or in the early Acts, in, in Acts. And then you hear Paul, first, now 1 first Timothy is written after the conclusion of the book of, of Acts. At the end of the book of Acts, Paul is in prison in Rome, then he's released from prison, has a ministry, then he's put back in prison. During that release period is when he writes 1 first, Timothy. First, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy and Philemon. Chapter 5, verse number 23. 1 Timothy 5, 20. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and that oft infirmities. Now here's the Apostle Paul that could send a handkerchief away from his body and heal people in Acts 19, prescribing medicine for Timothy, now, you know, you read this, why in the world wouldn't just, uh, I'm Timothy's a dear brother, his, his son of the, why would he just heal him? Mm-hmm. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse number 20. Erastus abode at Corinth. Now, this is the last book Paul writes. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Milenum, what? Sick. Now, if you know who Trophimus was, he was a, he was a dear, a dear and valuable ministry companion with the Apostle Paul, and he leaves him sick. If you had the power as an apostle to heal people, why would you leave him sick? Now, that's a, that's a question that you know, when you look, when you see the end of Paul's ministry, the healing program, the healing activity isn't going on anymore. He's prescribing medicine. And you say, well, why is that? Well, the only, the only, I mean, you can answer for yourself how you want to, but the only answer I'd suggest to you is that the things have gone away. The gift program, the healing program has been eliminated, isn't there anymore. And that's the, come with me to James chapter 5. That's the reason when you quote passages like this. James chapter 5. Now, the book of James, chapter 1, verse 1, who's it written to? James to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. It's written to the nation of Israel, scattered, the little flock scattered abroad. James 5, verse 14. Is, is any sick among you? How do you go pray for the sick? What do you do? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over them, anointing him with, with, with oil in the name of, the, of our Lord. And the prayer of faith shall, not maybe, not, 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 not possibly will, not if it's the will of God, shall, here's the will of God, save them that are sick. That's God's will because he wrote it in his book. 
and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sin, they shall be, 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 uh, be, be forgiven him. So it's not an issue of sin in your life. It's there's the will of God. Consider your faults one, with, uh, one to another. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that ye may be healed. So what do you do when somebody's sick in the past? You pray for them. You call the elders. And you pray, pray. Ask God to heal them. Now, if you've got any experience with any of this stuff, you know that those verses don't work. Now, you, you say, well, this one time. It's not talking about one time. We're not talking about something you heard somebody report that it might have happened. A few years ago, I was invited to preach down in North Carolina at Brother Perry Lemon's church. And the reason was that one of his deacons Gary Jordan had watched our sent our TV program, Forgotten Truths. Gary's sister was dying of cancer, and she was uh, very severe cancer. In fact, she she eventually succumbed to it. And they had practiced that verse right there. They'd call the elders. They'd got elders from their church. They'd got elders from other churches around that they're associated with them. Came in order with Laura, prayed, had pr- all night prayer meetings. And she just kept getting worse and worse. And now not only was she getting worse, they were getting concerned about their own, their own faith. What's going on with them? And Gary saw one of, the, one of the Forgotten Truths programs where I taught some of these things and the light went on. He told the pastor, he said, you, 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 know, you need to, I got, I, he called and got the video and said, I, you need to watch this. And I went there and I, I went to the, this lady's house, had the opportunity to visit with her sit on her couch, and her little 10-year-old daughter sitting there. And a little, her little daughter, after we'd talked and so forth, she said, she said to me, I want to thank you for telling my mama that God still loved her. Because what you do is you think God doesn't love you. Because you didn't know what the verses say. And I thought, you know, if there's any reason to appreciate this kind of stuff and to get it and to stand on it is so that you can see that God does still love you. There's a sign on the, down by church in Orlando, God loves you, get used to it. <laughs> and when I saw that sign, I thought I would say, God loves you, get over it. <laughs> but he does. But if you, if you read verses in the Bible that tell you he's going to do one thing and you think those verses are about you and they aren't, and like I said, you're never going to be big enough a day in your life stomp and romp all you want to to make God do something he isn't doing. He knows what he's doing. Amen. He's put it in the book so you can know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And when you walk in that, not in your desires, not in your want-tos or think-tos or your traditions, but you just relax, take a deep breath, and trust what he says. No matter who it contradicts, no matter who it's different from, it makes a difference. Pray without ceasing. You can constantly talk to him about the reality of who he's made you and his son. So what do you do in light of this? Since God isn't operating the, the physical healing programs, Somebody says, well, Brother Jordan, can you show me a verse that says God isn't healing people today? No. Can you show me one that it says he is? What right do you have to say God's doing something if he didn't say he's doing it? You say, well, I'll just claim the verses and, 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 and see what happens. I've got it. But just remember, if you're going to claim a verse, claim what the verse says, not what you want it to say. And when it doesn't happen, own up to the fact that it didn't happen. And quit blaming God, quit blaming yourself, blame the way you're studying the verses, because that's what the reality is. So what do you do? I, I said all that because I want to talk about what do, how, do, how, do you, how do you pray without ceasing? For, for, how do you continue in prayer for someone who's sick? What do you do? Well, one of the great verses Paul's instructed, 1 Corinthians 14, about prayer. And this is one of my 
personal go-to verses. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. And I will pray with what? Understanding also. When you pray, you need to talk to God intelligently with an understanding of what His Word tells you and how His Word tells you to relate to what the situation is. So come with me to Romans chapter 8. When you talk about sickness in the dispensation of grace, there are some key passages in your Bible that, that God has given for you to understand why you get sick, what it's about, and how it's going to relate to what, what your future is. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon, this is how I look at it, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Notice there is a suffering of this present time, and then there's a glory which shall be revealed in us. This suffering isn't worthy to be compared to that. When you look at what's coming for you, it makes the present suffering look like Beep. It doesn't make it. When you suffer, when you're sick, when you suffer for whatever, suffering magnifies what's going on and it makes the clock, the clock go tick, tock, tick, tock. If you're having a good time, the clock goes tick, 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 tick. But suffering magnifies and makes it go. He said, think about it. This Think about what's coming. The healing program for the body of Christ, you're going to get a glorified body like unto his. You've got a future. That's what's designed for you to understand to bring comfort in the present. Verse number 22. Well, just read verse, just keep, for verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. God's going to take the curse off of creation and all of creation is going to be liberated. Now verse 22. For we know, now here's something to know, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Ooh, that's a fact. Those of you that are younger, you don't believe in that necessarily unless you're looking at some older folks. But uh, Joe Biden's not the only one that shuffles <laughs> when he walks and can't remember things. Okay? The whole creation groans and travails until in pain. Look at that. You groan and travail in pain together. Woohoo! What a hope. That's the sufferings of this present time. And not only, some people say, well, that's just the world. Well, look at verse 23. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Believers are not exempt from the sufferings of this present age. But you're waiting for something. The adoption to with the redemption of our body. You see, in the end, it's just going to be glory. Between now, why, if in the end it's just going to be glory, and I'm here, I'm not at the end, then why am I still suffering? Because the dispensation of grace isn't over with yet. The reason you're still here is because God has extended the day of grace one more day. If he's going to extend the dispensation of grace one more day, you're going to have one more day of suffering. And it may be, as it has been for 2,000 years, you may go through the portal of death. Why? Because God extends the dispensation another day. Not that He doesn't love you. He's made provision for you in that. Back in verse 17, it talks about where if we suffer with Him, if He's long suffering and willing to extend the dispensation of grace another day, it means you're going to suffer with Him in that extension. 
So the, the groaning, the, the present suffering is due to the extension of the dispensation of grace. The ultimate healing program is the resurrection. If he puts that off to extend the day of grace another day and you suffer because of it. That's why. There's three reasons you suffer. One is we live in a fallen creation. Two is you do dumb, stupid things sometimes that make you suffer because you deserve it. You reap what you sow. And three, yea, all that live God in Christ Jesus have suffered persecution. A little bit of it comes from that. Most of it comes from the first one, and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of it comes from the second one. But any of that, if he extends the dispensation of Christ another day, then it's bec- we suffer with him in that extension. Verse number 24, for we are saved by hope, not not. That's not justification. That is, you're saved from the despair, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the dis- dysfunction. But hope that, make, that, that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? We're waiting for that manifestation of sons of God. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So what the doctrine does is gives you the ability to patiently endure why? Because you know the reason it's happening is that God's extended the day of grace another day. Now come with me to 2 Corinthians. So the reason that believers have suffering isn't, has nothing to do with God not loving them. It has to do with what God's doing in the dispensation of grace. And if you don't understand what he's... Listen, in the kingdom program, he healed them because that was, he was going to restore the, the nation, take the curse off of creation, and put them in a kingdom. There's a reason for that. In the dispensation of grace, he's extending the dispensation of grace another day. Your healing program is the resurrection. Mm-hmm. What a day that's going to be. Yeah, he's going to be so much better at, at creating <laughs> than he is now, than, than, than this is. Sin curse gone. Glorified body. Fashion like in his glorious body. Now you think about that. You say, wow. Adopted into his. But you're not there yet. Why? Because it's extending the, discipline, the day another day. Another day of grace, people get saved. Another day of grace for the body of Christ to be formed and edified. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know one of the things that happens when you go through difficulties? You, you learn the doctrine and you get comfort from the doctrine and now that suffering builds up in you the capacity to help other people that go through the things too. You're suffering because he extends the dispensation of grace. He leaves you here as a witness to his grace. Chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. So what do you do in, 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 in sickness? What do you do when you have Loved ones who are in sickness, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. He's not saying, go over here and get your outward man healed. He said, look, your outward man's going to perish, and as it perishes, you can be renewed day by day in your inner man. Yep. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Now, sometimes it doesn't feel light. Our life affliction, which is but for a moment. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way, does it? But the reality is feelings, feelings aren't the reality. The reality is what God's Word says. Mm-hmm. For our life affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, how does that come about? While we look, not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. How can you see something that you can't see? Mm-hmm. By that verse right down, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm-hmm. The evidence of things you don't see is what that book is about. That's right. The substance, the, the, the thing that gives solidity and substance to, your, to life is what that book says. While we look at the things that are not seen, but at the things that are, that, which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. They don't last. 
the sufferings of this present time aren't going to last. You know how I know? It's the point when a man wants to die. Or the resurrection. But the things which are eternal, they never go away. So where do you put your hope? Where, where's your, who are you anyway? And what happens is that if you come over to chapter 12, verse 8, Paul says, for this thing, I beseech the Lord three times. Paul said, I got this problem, and I asked the Lord three times, take it away. Now, verse number 9, and he said unto me, when you're looking at the problems, the physical illnesses, the, 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 the physical afflictions, the thorn of the flesh Paul talks about here, when you're looking at it and you say, Lord, take it away, Here's what he says to you. To me, the most important part of all this is, and he said, here's what God said when I asked him to take away the physical infirmity. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I'm going to put something in you. I'll put some truth in you, some, some life in you that's perfected, that grows and grows to maturity. In your weakness. Now Paul's response. Most gladly therefore. Will I glory in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. In reproaches. In necessities. In persecutions. In distresses. For Christ's sake. For when I am weak. Then am I strong. You know what you demonstrate. When, when, when your weakness and you trust him. You demonstrate it has to be him, not you. Most gladly, therefore, there's a change in the attitude that Paul had about the problems when he realized that God's grace, the sufficiency of God, of who God had made him in Christ. It didn't make the pain, the physical pain, any less. But it explained it. And you understand that. And there's an inner strength that comes. Now, the adversary seeks to shut you down. Seeks to try to make you lose your nerve. Try to make you afraid. He uses sickness to convince you that God isn't for you. Because when the physical pain gets to be, whether it's in you or your loved one, the physical pain gets to be consuming, you say, where's God? Does he really love me? If he loved me, how could he let this happen to me? Come back with me to Romans 8. Because here's where faith goes. And here's where an understanding of who you are in Christ goes. Romans 8 verse 31. What shall we say then? To these, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Folks, God's for you. How do you know? But God commended his love toward us and that we were yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. For, read verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died. We'll go back to verse number. I, I, I skipped verse 32. Verse 31, what should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall I not with him also freely give us all things? You know what that means? God's for you. You look to Calvary and you see it. And if he freely delivered him up for you, you don't have to worry about everything else. And when circumstances in life come try to tell you God isn't for you, you look at those circumstances in life and just give them a Bronx cheer. Because God's for me. And point to Calvary and shut their mouth. And when the physical things in life 
whether it's sickness or whatever else, loom up as reality, they're not reality. And your faith sees the things that you can't see, which are is real and is eternal. Now, in that context, how do you pray? Look back at verse, you're in Romans 8, look at verse 26. To me, this is, this is the essence. So how do you pray for, for folks that are sick? Whether it's everyday illnesses or chronic pain or terminal disease or wisdom for the doctors? How do you pray? Well, the first thing you need to do is recognize that God is in you. God is working in you. He personally cares for you. If we suffer with him, he's already long-suffering. And you're just entering into what he's doing. And you need to learn to depend on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Pray with understanding. Romans 8, verse 26. This is the mechanics of how prayer works for you and me. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Well, he's also, here's something else he's going to do. Verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Spirit of God's going to bear witness through his word that you are his. But he's also going to help your infirmities. Now, what are your infirmities? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. How do you pray for, the, for sick people? You don't know. But you ought to know. Think about what the, we don't know what to pray for as we don't know what to pray for. I'm ignorant. I don't know how to pray in this circle as you ought. I ought to know. Now, how come I ought to know if I don't know? God's word tells me the things I need to know about the circumstance. But I pray, you know, a lot, we pray pretty much, most of the time we pray ignorant, dumb prayers. Because we don't know exactly how to do it. So here I am, I ought to know, the information is in the book, verse 27, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God. Where do you find the will of God? You don't look for circumstances out there. You look in the book. So I ought to know because the book tells me, but I haven't figured out what, how to take what God's word says and apply it here. So what am I going to I'm going to pray without ceasing. I'm going to talk to God about what's going on and about what his word says and how to bring that, those two things together. Well, how does that work? Verse 26. We don't know how to pray for it as we ought. But, so here's the remedy. The spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit's making no such going to the Word of God. When I pray, I still get the circumstance. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm being dumb, Lord. I don't know exactly how. But your Word's got the answer. And as I pray, the Spirit helps our infirmities. When it says helps, by the way, when you help somebody, it doesn't mean they do it all or you do it all. It means you do it together. Have you ever seen a cross-cut saw? You know what that is? Saw, you know, saw a log, got on one side, pull it up. Back in the 70s, we, we lived in the country in Alabama. I'd never seen a, I, I'm a city slicker. I was ra- raised in the second largest city in Mobile. I'd never lived in the country. We were out in the country and Fellas, you, you need to get some firewood. So we go, we go in, he's got these trees they felled, and he's got this cross-cut saw. I didn't know anything about a cross-cut saw. You know, vroom, power saw or something. So he, he takes that cross-cut saw. He gets on one side of it, and I'm on the other. And he said, you don't push, you pull. That's the rule. So he'd pull across, and I'd pull back. Well, you know, he'd be pulling. So I'd push a little bit. You know what happens when you push? He said, you're going to lose your teeth. It don't work. So the way you cross cut saw is he pulls, then you pull. He pulls, and then you pull. You work together. And you're helpers together. And when you do your part, he does his part. You know what? The law gets sawed. If you don't, you try. It doesn't work. That word help, there's that kind of, when I think of that word, I think of that, that uh, Mr. Adams doing that with me. The Spirit helps. He works with me when I pray. So I have to pray. I have to talk to God about it. 
and he helps my ignorance. There's God's word that needs to be brought to bear into this. So I began to pray. Now, look, what's what happens when I, when, when I pray? The Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, there's all kind of superstition about that verse. How do you make groanings that you can't utter? Well, think about it like this. Have you ever been in such agony that you couldn't express it? Now, you young folks, maybe you haven't been there, but if you're my age, you know what I'm talking about. There's a level of agony that you get at that you just can't verbalize. You can't speak it. Need, there are three levels of need in my thinking. When you see someone that's sick, you see it out, you hear, talk to Barbara or Joe or or Mike about about Joe, he's coughing. (coughs) And he's got a, a hack that like nobody ever heard. Well, you know what that tells you? There's a problem. It calls your attention to the problem. So there's this outward surface level. That calls, us, calls your attention to the need. When you, then you get in, involved personally with them and you find out the next level. There's a, there's a need under that. And there's some physical thing that needs to be dealt with. The surface level calls your attention to it. Then you go and become personally involved and you get to the underlying issue. But when you get there and you're actually talking to God about these people, and about the service, you'll find out there's something even deeper, a more deeper level. That's that groan as it can't be uttered. What God, the Holy, when you pray for the sick, what God does, what the Holy Spirit does, is he takes you beyond that surface level and even beyond the immediate need level, right down to the deepest level of their spiritual need. And you're able to minister there. And you're beyond the surface. And you're down to what's the the deepest level. And the way you get there is by taking God's word, verse 27, and applying it to the circumstance. God, the Holy Spirit, works through his word as you talk to God about what's going on with them. And you're bringing them right down to the deepest level of their need to minister to them God's word. That's a process. And it happens as you pray for them in line with what God's word says. Not tradition, not even your desires, but you're taking God and God, the Holy Spirit, works through the word. So as you take the reality of who you are in Christ and you apply that, then you pray as you ought to pray. And the Spirit of God takes that word and makes intercession for this. It has that go between ministering according to God's will. The result of that, if you don't see that, Philippians chapter 4, John preemptively read this earlier. He didn't always want to talk about it, but of course he doesn't know much of anything anyway. But I'm working on that too. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. Be careful for nothing. Now, when he says be careful for nothing, that word careful is the idea. You remember Martha in Luke chapter number, uh, number 10? She's, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and cumbered about by many things. Mm-hmm. You, you're over here worrying and fiddling, fidgeting with the details. When Mary was sitting at his feet listening to his word, that was the good thing. Don't be, don't be all consumed with the details, worrying about what's going on. But in everything, every day, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Talk to God about what you see needs to be done. Let your request. Mm-hmm. But let those requests be what? Informed and guided by what God's word says. I'm going to make this request, Lord, but I don't know what to pray for as I ought to. Your word's got to educate me about these things. So we'll talk about this and if, it, if as, as the word corrects me. But when... I'm going to, by prayer, by talking to God, supplication, asking him for, for, for information and help with thanksgiving. Because I have the sufficiency of his grace in Christ. 
and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, better than understanding why, will keep, guard your hearts and minds by, through Christ Jesus. Amen. That peace in the midst of the, 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 the suffering when you focus on the real, lasting, spiritual issues and the blessings, His love, His grace, His power, all those things, when that's the focus, you see God work peace in you and in them. Ephesians chapter 3, the last two verses. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. (laughs) Now, that verse has got a context, so don't just yank yank that verse out of its context, stick it on the wall. If you go back to verse 16, or verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is, is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in you by faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and the height and to know the love of Christ. That's what Paul's asking about. And after he prays that for the believers, he says, now to him that's able to do abundantly above all that I just ask or that I even could think about asking. According to the power that worketh in you, unto him be glory. So if you're going to pray for them, pray the pray verse 16, 17, 18, and 19. That God would strengthen them in their inner man. That they'd see who they are in Christ and be able to comprehend the breadth and the length and the depth of what God's doing and to know the love of Christ that passeth all knowledge. So they could be filled with the fullness of God himself. When you pray for lost people, for, for, for sick people, that's the way you pray for them. Now the healing program for the body of Christ is the rapture, the resurrection. You're going to appear with him in glory. If you want to see what you're going to look like, it's Philippians 3 verse 20. Our conversation is in heaven from which we also look for the Savior who shall change our vile body. And by the way, when you go through sickness, you're going to believe there's a vile body. You're going to get so sick of that body. Change our vile body that it might be fashioned unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he's able to subdue all things unto himself. you got a wonderful future ahead. That's what your future holds in store. And that's what can keep your hearts and your minds till then. What a prospect, child of glory, doth the future hold in store? By the wildest flights of fancy, thou couldst never ask for more. Heir of God, join heir with his own beloved son. God to you could not have promised more bliss than he's done. And as he extends, if he extends the day of grace another day, and another day and another day until your physical body goes away of all flesh. It's because of his grace being extended to others. But that grace works in you. Not just, not just work, it works peace in you. And it keeps your hearts and minds till then. So when you pray for folks that are sick, pray for them in light of who you are in Christ and about what God's doing today. And let the, let, the, let the grace of God not just be sufficient. Let it be the thing that rejo- is the joy and rejoicing of your heart. And I say that now. I've been saying that for 40 years. But I say it now as a person in a body that kind of knows more about it than I used to. And it, but it's just as real no matter what. So pray with understanding. And let God's word be what rejoices you, you know, what, 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 what thrills your heart. Now, it all, it all starts because you have Christ in you, and you're in, you're in him, and he's in you. And you don't get in him, and you don't get him in you by religious works, by out, thing, out things you do, by running aisles. and doing, You get that by your faith resting exclusively 
in who God has made him to be for you and letting God give you his life. If you've never trusted Christ exclusively, that's where it starts. You can do that right where you sit. You don't have to go into work, do anything, move a muscle. You don't have to pray a prayer. You just have to believe, trust, rely upon Jesus Christ to be the Savior who died and rose again for you to be. Those of you that are saved, listen, that's who you are. God gives you, bless you with all spiritual blessing. At that moment, just let those things that he gave you, spend your life discovering them and then letting them work in your life for his glory. And for those folks that are sick, whether it's you or someone you're praying for, you love them, just, just point them to God's grace and let that work in their hearts, his life, his, his peace. Okay? All right. I just pray there be some help for you. I know there's a number of you that have those situations, and if you don't, you will. So uh, live, in, live, in, live in light of the reality of who God's made you in Christ and what God's doing today. That's why it's such an important thing. It's not about making, making us different from everybody else. It's making us understand what God's doing and living in that. Father, we thank you this morning for your love and your grace. We thank you for life in Christ Jesus. And I pray for each of us that the reality of who we are in Christ, who your grace has made us, would be the thing that captivates our hearts, fortifies us in our inner man, so that we can live in the circumstances of life, no matter what they are, in a way that honors our Savior. And we thank you in his name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing number three. Number three.